the, the title probably suggests that this was not a successful exercise. Uh, so the best I'm going to be able to do is tell you what did work, what I think caused it not to work, uh, and I don't have a quantitative answer to these questions, uh, but I think it leads us towards what we might do in the future to understand what's going on with some of these long-distance paths now. Now, I took to Hawaii, 77-centimetre uh, edition, 60 watts, and on the left-hand side, this is up the mountain uh, in uh, uh, what's called the Big Island. The, the duct, in fact, rises from a couple of hundred metres in California to about 2,000 metres in Hawaii. So you've got to find a, a location fairly high up. In this case... I'm actually doing EME to test that the system works, and it did and produced about the right results uh, to a station in the US. And my colleague at the other end also did EME, and I was able to copy him. So we knew the system was working. Uh, we were all on frequency, and the system performance was about what we expected. On the right-hand side is the system set up for transport because we had to transport it up the mountain every day, pull it out and get it to work. Uh, now, I had a number of people at the other end, but the one that gave me the best chance was this guy running 725 watts <laughs> on 10 gigs. <laughs> to a 1.8 metre dish. <laughs> uh, now, he, he, he was going portable. This is his portable uh, station. <laughs> and you can see by the size of the generators there that it took some effort <laughs> to produce this station. Uh, it's actually not easy in the whole of California to find locations where you can get a good takeoff at about the right height of the duct. And uh, this is probably the only one we found in the whole of California. Now, the results were on 432, a, in there were a lot of problems with COVID and other things, so the time wasn't as what we originally planned, but we, uh, we were operational for 21 days. We got 383 whisper decodes and a best signal of plus 17 dB. Now, while the system, this was a failure, most of you'd be pretty happy with a four, uh, uh, working 4,000 kilometres on... 432, uh, and getting essentially decodes every second day, uh, and up to 17 dB, but absolutely nothing on 10 gigs where he was running much higher power. Uh, we had much more antenna gain. Uh, we used single tones to try and find the weaker signals. So the question is, why? And it turns out our system performance was about 60 dB better on 10 gigs than on 432. And above a single tone, we were about 45 dB above a single tone with our best signals on 432. So somehow we were losing about 105 dB. Uh, now, that sort of covers that. Uh, now, the, one of the reasons for going to Hawaii is that essentially all of the microwave world records up to 5.7 gigs have been done on the Hawaii to California or Mexico path. Uh, Admittedly, only one contact ever on 5.7, right back in 1991. Um, 
The, the longer distance contacts that have been done on 10 gigs, uh, the, I've included the Cape Verde Islands because I think that's an interesting example, which I'll discuss next. And then the best ones, uh, the ones we've done from Western Australia across to Tasmania. Now, this is a, a, uh, a map of the world of the various wind systems. And you'll see in South, uh, Southern Australia, we're basically focused, we're, we're using westerlies, and those who use this path will note that there's generally got to be a strong high in the bite. And what that does is that high circulates fairly dry air down over the Southern Ocean, uh, dry and warm air, and that difference produces an inversion uh, and allows us to have propagation. The dif difficulty is these highs very rarely extend over the full path. They're not bad between sort of Western Australia and South Australia, but as soon as you extend the path, inevitably the high gets pushed by the westerly too far away from Western Australia, a cold front comes through, and as soon as that happens, you lose propagation. And you've got to get the, prop the high to extend all the way to southern Tasmania, uh, to, well, to, sorry, northern Tasmania, uh, before it leaves Western Australia. And, and that puts a big limit. It's probably only, in my estimation, about once a year that it's possible to work from uh, Western Australia right across to Tasmania. Now, the other good paths that, that have been done is Portugal to Cape Verde Islands. Now, this is partly a trade winds path, and that's the yellow, and the advantage they've got is that they're getting winds off the Sahara Desert, very dry air and low absorption. And the Hawaii path, well, it's, it's a longer path. It's a trade winds path. But the air is driven by a high pressure system just above that path. And it's all coming across the sea, moisture's evaporating into the sea. It's getting trapped in the duct. And while you don't generally think absorption and moisture is a problem at 10 gigs, uh, those who work on 24 and 47 higher up know how important it is. And the losses are only sort of 0.03 dB per kilometre, which doesn't sound much, but you multiply it by 4,000 kilometres, that's 120 dB. And so life becomes difficult. Now, when you look at the actual duct, the, the red curve is the temperature, the blue is dew point, the, the green is what's called the modified refractive gradient, and the advantage of that modified refractive gradient, you can draw a straight line from the, where the duct goes most negative back to where it's negative, and that tells you how thick the duct is. But if you look at the dew point, you'll see it's over that whole part of the duct, the dew point's the same as the temperature on this path. Uh, that means 100% humidity. And then if you look at the graph at the right, you'll see the atmospheric attenuation is the order of 60 dB. And as soon as you get above the duct, it drops off but of course, doesn't help your propagation. Uh, now we had 105 dB to spare, we thought, so 60 dB didn't, dB didn't explain all the problem. But another part of it is once, you're, once you've got 100% humidity, it actually forms cloud. And cloud has water droplets in it. Uh, and that's additional attenuation. 
Now, this is typically what it looks like on the path, and sort of most of it's actually in cloud. Now, there's certainly some additional attenuation because of the cloud. At the moment, we can't estimate it very accurately. There's three references we have found, and they vary between 20 and 60 dB. Uh, but if it's at the 60 dB end, it would explain why we're getting nothing. Uh, if it's at the 20 dB end, it, it doesn't explain it. So there's still a lot more to learn about the implications of the cloud. The other part when you look at this cloud is there tends to be some spotted cloud as you move further along the path from California. There's sort of smooth cloud, which is generally stratocumulus. And then it moves into cumulus, which is this spotty stuff. And the absorption in cumulus is very high, but it's only over spotty areas. So whether it's but what, what actually comes from that is still to be determined. So uh, the, the other thing with cumulus is, of course, there's generally rain under cumulus clouds, which again causes a lot of, of the problem. So we're looking at uh, losses of sort of 60 dB due to atmospheric gases. Some, something of the order of 40 dB due to cloud. It depends on the height, the thickness of the cloud and everything else. And if there's any rain on the path, then that's just going to kill you. It can be, depending on the strength of the rain, just over 200 kilometres, uh, 20 to 250 dB. Uh, now, other possible sources are the the evidence is that the the nature of the duct changes dramatically when you move from the stratocumulus to the cumulus clouds, and this is possibly a discontinuity. Uh, and if you're not in the duct, and it's very hard to determine whether you're in the duct, uh, it'll cost you 10 dB or more if you're below the duct. The advantage of using high-going dishes get, is potentially a negative because you've got a beam width that's only one degree uh, and you've got to be right in the duct <laughs> to have any chance and you've got to be beaming at the angle of the duct because anything more than about 0.7 of a degree, you go straight through the duct. So, uh, So my conclusions are the most likely reason we didn't get signals was at the attenuation due to atmospheric gases, cloud and rain. There have been better conditions reported in the past at VHF, like uh, five and nine plus. Very hard to judge reports like five and nine plus in a quantitative sense when people have got preamps and things. Uh, you've really got to optimise your elevation to the duct and you've got to ensure that these narrow beam with antennas are aligned. And there's, there's potentially a slope on the duct as it rises up the mountain and a similar problem at the other end. Uh, I can't say absolutely what the reason is, but I'm uh, there's a whole lot of things that it may be a bit of all these things that uh, makes it not work. A number of people have, contribu have contributed to making this work. I won't read them all, but uh, I thank them. Rick's fantastic. <laughs> Um, I was hoping you do this, but um, a bit, bit of background. 2015, when I presented your presentation at the uh, uh, San, uh, San Diego uh, Microwave Conference, a lot of people were swooning around. I mean, for a couple of years, we were talking about this, and 
the one thing I can pushing back, which you've raised here, is what is optimum height? And the, the feeling there was go to the top of the, the uh, yes. volcano, which I said rubbish. But the other bit I started floating with was just it, it's in some of these cases, it may not have been just a single mode going across there. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, but I've always thought that two metres shouldn't be used because of the possibility that sporadic E was part of the problem. And that's why I went to 432 as a reference. Uh, N6CA, who is the guru of all this uh, and did all this early work, is absolutely sure that uh, sporadic E is not involved. Well, there's no doubt that they're... That the, I mean, I say the duck rises, but it doesn't rise linearly. And I think at times, you know, it breaks off. Uh, if, if you sort of compare my results on 432 with a perfect duct assuming inverse with distance, I'm losing about 60 dB even when there's the best signals. So there's some losses. Uh, I, I should say they have got beacons up at 2,500 metres. Uh, unfortunately, for various reasons, none of them worked when I was there. <laughs> uh, but the, the advantage of where they've got it, there's a community radio station, so they've got power and a building and they, you know, whereas the problem is there are very few locations with a good takeoff which you can use to optimise your height to the duct. Uh, as soon as you get off the road, you're in this rough volcanic rock that rips your tyres apart. Uh, um, just wondering whether you're going to get on the bike again. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. This, this, I found this exercise beyond what someone of 80 years should do. 